for me personally and for the foundation, it's been a journey of discovery uh, over the last year. Uh, a lot of people don't believe me when I say I did not know I was related to Gene Scott and Porter until about 18 months ago. It's like, what? Especially when I talk to people in Indiana, it's like, were you living under a rock? Or... <laughs> well, I come from the Lost Michigan branch, you know, and um, I, I have to say that thanks to my cousin Chris and her interest in genealogy and willingness to provide information, she kind of laid the foundation and the, the framework for making this discovery. It was about two years ago that Chris and her husband Daryl were visiting learning about the Stratton Foundation, learning about supporting filmmaking students, and Chris said, well, Doug, did you know that we're related to somebody down in Indiana that wrote books and made movies? And I said, Chris, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, well, the, the name was uh, uh, Gene Stratton Porter. And I said, well, Chris, is that like another singing cowboy? <laughs> it's like deer in the headlights. It's like, really? And after that, I began doing some internet searches and began to realize that this was a prominent person and I, but neither of us really knew exactly how we were related. And um, eventually, it was like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And for both of us, we were able to gather up information and make some connections and through tools that are available today, we were able to define that we were actually first cousins four generations removed. That Gene's grandfather, Joseph, is our great, 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 great grandfather. So that's the common ancestor that we have. And uh, it was just very, the moment of that discovery was very exhilarating. And that's what then put us into a connection with the, the sites. For me, the thank you list begins with the citizens of the state of Indiana. And Act they support these state historic home sites and enable their government to provide the funding that's made these places so interesting and fascinating and of value to the public to come out and learn about Gene Stratton Porter and her significance and, and contributions. If the citizens of the state of Indiana didn't support that, uh, along with the, the dedicated groups of people that do that, um, I think that the property upon which we're standing today would either be a subdivision um, or just some kind of a, uh, that the capital would be a pile of logs. But the fact that people value and recognize the significance and fought the political battles and whatnot that uh, got the funding to, to do this, um, I really owe a debt of gratitude from the Stratton family to, to the citizens of Indiana professional staff that, that operate these uh, sites. We call it Cabin Wildflower Woods because if you can come here in uh, late April or early May, there is just an explosion of wildflowers on these grounds. And this entire hillside here is covered in, uh, it's called Trillium grandiflorum, or a large flowered trillium, so they have those great big white petals. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And that's about the same time that Tracy and I first came here in 2006. And uh, we were just so blown away with the property. Um, we didn't realize we'd be so lucky as to actually live here. And this is Gene Stratton Porter's garden shed. And uh, I always joke with visitors that this is her kind of equivalent of a mini barn. And it's um, about as big as my first house. <laughs> it's a 4,300 square foot Wisconsin cedar cabin. And we always say cabin. Because uh, usually when you think of a log cabin, you think of a tiny little structure. But this has got a full basement, attic, uh, second floor, it's got seven rooms in it, and a beautiful floor plan on the, the first floor. And she actually designed both the homes in Geneva and Rome City. Um, so they were her design, and if you visit Geneva, you'll see a lot of common uh, architectural elements, like the built-in bookcases and the beautiful paneling. Um, down there, all the paneling was a beautiful uh, honey oak color, and here it's all cherry. 
and she actually harvested the cherry here on site and then used that for her paneling. This is the, the formal dining room, so this is again uh, one of the areas where you can see the beautiful wood paneling and the pocket doors and uh, all the built-in bookcases again, uh, the corner case where she would have kept her willowware, uh, china, and um, some different examples of her photography up on the walls. Um, I usually tell people that while they might not look, the photographs might not look particularly remarkable today, you have to realize that when she was shooting these back in the late 1890s, early 1900s, she had a 4x5 inch glass plate box camera. And to capture uh, an action shot like this little blue jay popping up with a, a camera that was so slow and clunky as that, um, you know, today we have cameras like Amanda has where you can shoot five frames a second very easily. And and she was shooting with this uh, view camera, she would have um, a negative holder that would have a sheet of film on either side. So she would sl slip the negative holder into the back of the camera, pull the slide, make the exposure, put the slide back in, and then flip it over to be able to take a second shot. Very slow. And then she would have to take it back, uh, develop the negative, uh, let it dry, and then make the, the paper print after that. So. You know, uh, we can look at things immediately on the back of our camera. Uh, so, it took a lot of patience uh, to, to shoot back then. I also kind of joke that even though Charles was a wealthy businessman um, and had plumbing, indoor plumbing, an indoor bathroom, he still had to go out and use the outhouse because Jean was so busy doing all of her photographic development <laughs> in, in the bathroom that <laughs> he, he was uh, booted out to the outhouse. <laughs> mentioned this would have been the formal parlor. Um, it's amazing to me to think that Jean was one of those people who anything she set her mind to she mastered. So she played piano, she played violin, um, recorder, of course had her Victrola that she could listen to music as well. She did needlepoint, she did watercolors, hand tinted her photographs, did the photographs, um, as Dave was mentioning, developed all of the photographs. Kodak actually contacted her and said, how do you get your photos to turn out so well? We want to come study what you do and how you do it. And she was embarrassed by the fact that she developed the photos in the bathtub and said, oh, no, no, it must just be the water here and kind of kept them away. Um, but this would have been the, the formal parlor. And as Dave mentioned, we've got the million dollar window here that, of course, on the days when we don't have motorboats and jet skis going by is a lovely view. And then this is the fireplace of friendship because people would send her rocks when they were out traveling. Charles would go out with his brother and collect rocks and bring them back. And so she had this fireplace put together with all of the rocks that people brought back for her that had particular meaning. And we found two little hidden pictures from Jean. There's a moth here in the middle with the wings and the body and its head. Oh. And then over here, we've got a revolutionary soldier with this little tricorn cap and his bun, and then his jacket with the sash and belt, and his pants. But you can see it's another example of just how sentimental Jean was, that she wanted to be surrounded by all of these little memories, and I'm sure each rock had a story for her. So this was her conservatory, where she would do a lot of her work in the winter when she needed to bring the plants indoors, or bring cuttings of the plants indoors. And the fun thing about this room, you'll notice that the window sills are really wide. So she would close off the door there, close off the door there, open all of these windows, and sprinkle bird seeds. So as she was in here working, the birds would come in, and she could be surrounded by her birds. And she opened up the entire home for homemakers and different women's groups, but this was the room she loved to show off because it was so different at the time, and she always said, she was, she was very contradictory in a lot of ways. She was very modern, wanted to wear pants, wanted to go out and do her own thing, but her family was the most important thing. And much like the kitchen, this is where you should be working. You have to take care of your family, but you can have every convenience and comfort in order to do that. 
so she was very proud of this room when she would open up the house.